Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Koli Para and I am a virologist working at the Food and Drug Administration, also known as the FDA. I'm sure many of you are wondering what in the world does a virologist do and who even are they? Well, I'm here to provide the answers to those two very important questions and more. Hopefully you'll come to see the beauty of virology just as I have. And who knows, you may even decide to pursue this career as your own profession. Well, let me begin by first giving you an overview of who a virologist is. As you may have guessed from the name itself, a virologist is a microbiology specialist who focuses on the study of viruses and virus-like agents. Essentially, I'm an expert of all things viruses. I study viruses, I test viruses, I eradicate viruses. Or at least I come up with products to eradicate viruses. So I spend a lot of time with these nasty disease-causing viruses. I know that sounds dangerous, and it is, especially since I work with these viruses directly, interacting with them to see how they work and how they respond. But I do take a huge amount of precautions when working with them in order to ensure that I don't contract any of the diseases caused by them. Some of these precautions that I take are always wearing protective clothing, such as gloves, goggles, lab coats, and in some cases, when I'm handling extremely dangerous viruses, a protective suit. The suits are quite huge and heavy. It's like an astronaut's suit, space suit, uh, in a way. But most of the time, I don't need to be decked out in a protective suit, since the type of virus I'm currently working with is not an airborne pathogen. However, it is still highly contagious, but in a different way. At the FDA, I work as a principal investigator within the Laboratory of Emerging Pathogens. Part of the job description was that I develop an independent program on molecular viro virology with an emphasis on viruses and other emerging blood viruses that present a risk to blood supply. Once I got the job, I decided to focus my research on the hepatitis C virus due to its increasing commonality and the lack of a vaccination against it. More concerning is the fact that the hepatitis C virus leads to liver cancer, and with no vaccine against this virus, it makes it all the more likelier for someone to develop liver cancer. Hepatitis C is a virus that is spread and transmitted when the blood of an infected person enters into the bloodstream of another. This means that when I handle the virus, I have to ensure that I don't let it touch my skin at all. And case there is a crack or an opening of some sort that will allow it to enter my bloodstream. So when I'm studying a sample of the virus underneath a microscope or testing to see if temperature or a certain compound has an effect on the virus, I always use personal protective equipment such as gloves, gowns, lab coats, lab coats, <laughs> um, face shields, masks, eye protection, and even pocket masks. Right now, I'm working on creating a vaccine against hepatitis C in order to prevent liver cancer. You see, a whopping 50% of liver cancer diagnoses are due to HCV alone. So if we can prevent HCV from taking a hold of the body, we can prevent liver cancer. And the way to do this is by training the body on how to deal with hepatitis C in the case that it does enter the body. In other words, we need a vaccine that will cause the body to be prepared with antibodies to fight off the hepatitis C vaccine. So far, I have not yet to finalize a vaccine for hepatitis C, but I have amassed a great deal of knowledge about the virus through the countless days spent studying this vaccine, or this virus. I have taken various samples of the virus and put it underneath the microscope to view its structure. What I found was that the virus has an RNA core, which is where all its genetic information is stored, and is surrounded by a protective layer of protein and a lipid envelope around the whole entire thing. Within the lipid envelope, there lies glycoproteins that contain the toxic substances that lead to liver cancer and more. These toxic substances, well, these glycoproteins, are called E1 and E2. The fact that it has an RNA core tells me that it will mutate itself into various genetic variations as it spreads throughout the body. In order to test that characteristic of the virus, I created a sort of culture of the virus and allowed it to spread and grow throughout the dish. After each day, I'd look at the growing virus, taking numerous samples and isolating the RNA from each molecule of hepatitis C. 
I then analyzed the code of the RNA by making various isolations undergo PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, which is a process that creates multiple copies of the DNA, or in this case the RNA, that we are studying. These multiple copies can then be analyzed to know if there are any genetic variations within each hepatitis C molecule. When I did this, lo and behold, I found multiple versions of the virus, which supported my assumption that the RNA core allows this virus to mutate itself. The fact that this virus actually mutates into various versions of itself makes it more difficult for me to create a vaccine. This means that the vaccine has to train the body in such a way that the body recognizes the virus almost immediately so that it can eradicate the initial hepat hepatitis C virus molecules so quickly that there isn't even a chance for the virus to mutate into new versions of itself. Plus, the fact that this virus mutates so quickly means that treating the virus will be even more difficult. So it is better to find a vaccine to prevent hepatitis C so we can prevent liver cancer from occurring. However, upon further research of the variations of the virus, there are 21 substrains, which stems from the virus's genomic mutations. So an individual can be affected with any of the 21 variations of the virus. So our vaccine needs to be able to create antibodies for any of the 21 strains. This discovery led me to think that maybe I need to create a vaccine that can be given in multiple doses so that the body eventually gains resistance to all of the variations of hepatitis C. This led me to my first attempt of creating a vaccine for the hepatitis C virus. I decided to use a technique that is used to create the hepatitis B vaccine. Since hepatitis C and hepatitis B come from the same family of viruses, However, hepatitis C is resistant to heat, unlike hepatitis B and A, as I found from conducting an experiment on heat and these viruses. I decided to create a vaccine for each, each ver version of hepatitis C by pulling out a segment of DNA that is unique, or segment of RNA, that is unique to each HCV version with tweezers. The segment of RNA that I pulled out was then added to the RNA of a yeast cell, which is in a yeast culture, and then a purifier was used to isolate the antigen that was produced by the yeast cells in response to the segment of DNA or RNA introduced to the culture. These antigens are then filled into syringe, thus creating the vaccine. In this way, I was able to create 21 different vaccines for each of the known 21 versions or strains of HCV. But before I could prevent present these findings to the scientific community and the board of at FDA, which is a routine part of my job since I am specifically conducting research on hepatitis C and attempting to create a vaccine for it, I had to test it. In order to do so, I got samples of rats who were similar in weight, height, body measurement, etc. And then I injected each group of rats with one of the 21 vaccines created. Then, after about a week or two, I injected the correlated hepatitis C vaccine into each of the rats. After about a day, I took a sample of each of their blood while wearing protective clothing and tested for the presence of the hepatitis C virus. After many trials, I found that my vaccines did work. However, these vaccines weren't a viable option since that would require 21 different vaccine vaccinations just to prevent this one virus. However, however, one commonality I've discovered, discovered among all of the variations of hepatitis C is that they all contain the same glycoproteins of E1 and E2 in their lipid envelope. When I grew the different strains of the hepatitis C virus and tested to see what glycoproteins these various strains used to attach to a cell membrane in a sample of human blood, they all had E1 and E2. And since E1 and E2 allows the virus to go undetected by the immune system, if we could somehow make the glycoproteins of E1 and E2 become or seem dangerous to the human body, then the body will mount an attack against all forms of the hep C virus. As of right now, I'm in the process of isolating the glycoproteins and see how they interact with the cell membrane in various blood samples to better understand the mechanisms that allow them to go undetected in the immune system. It could be possible that by isolating the E1 and the E2 glycoproteins, 
and putting them in a harmless but similar virus and creating a vaccine from them by isolating the DNA or RNA, it could lead to the body fight being able to fight all strains of the hepatitis C virus. Essentially, by associating E1 and E2 glycoproteins with a virus, the body may start to fight off hepatitis C immediately upon its entrance into the body. And then, upon recognizing E1 and E2 structures that are on the surface of the hepatitis C virus, the body may launch antibodies to fight against and eradicate the virus. Obviously, I will have to test this further by isolating the E1 and E2 glycoproteins and inserting it into a different virus, which will require me to test out and find out the best virus carrier to cause an immune response. I hope to find a vaccine to give the public for HCV through continuous testing, research, and trials. Ultimately, I hope this little chat has helped you better understand everything that I do as a virologist, as well as give you a little more of an insight into my quest to create a hepatitis C vaccine. Thanks for joining me. Bye!